So I'm really grateful to be closing uh, this Waterford Writers Weekend. It's um, it's a wonderful privilege. The Arts Office of County Waterford um, have, uh, you know, they've they've had such a stellar lineup here. So it's a great privilege for me to close it. And I'd like to begin with a poem that was written for my brother in uh, Canberra, who's an emigrant and has been from County Waterford for the last 16 years. So this is a poem called Skype. Sit in your night chair and walk the morning streets of Canberra. Your cold kitchen's silence is another hemisphere of warmth and chirping birds. With open laptop, your virtual brother will retreat indoors, passing an orange tree, disconnecting the fruit for you to see. At the end, it will be good night and good morning. Your winter lips will send a kiss by fingertips to those of summer, and your palm will touch the cheek of his flat screen face. Um, so this next poem, um, I was very grateful and uh, very lucky to the, um, I'm grateful to the editors of the venerable London magazine for uh, publishing this poem in the spring of 2021. And I thought it might be nice to read it for the Irish Museum of the Science and Story of Time, which is um, a fascinating museum that has only opened in Waterford uh, in the last year. And it's a poem that speaks to the speed and passage of time. And thanks um, actually to the owners of this premises, 33 The Mall, and to the uh, generous support of Margaret Organ in the Arts Office, this poem was made into a film for Poetry Day Ireland as part of the Food for the Soul project in 2021. So uh, it's called Tempest. And on his body I saw, affixed to his sternum, through the skin of his chest, the hands of a clock. Thick black rulers, Swiss precision in the cogs of his heart, moving them on. The spider leg minute hand swept with unforgiving speed, circumnavigating his torso, forward advancing, always to his right. No time to look left. Release valves like fish gills flapped under his ribs, letting him breathe out of beat every now and then. He would sometimes escape to pound loudly on the piano or madly splash paint at a blank canvas. So there's a wonderful um, filmmaker in Dungarvan called John Birmingham and his company is called All That Can Be Productions and he translated this poem into the most wonderful graphics and I think they're available on YouTube if anybody cares to, to, to see them. Um, Seven Sugar Cubes is my next poem and I suppose in a way it speaks to the first poem um, that I read called Skype because it was um, an autobiographical poem that was written at the end of 2015 or probably a, a, a little bit afterwards and it refers to the receipt of news of my father's death while he was visiting my brother in Canberra. Um, he got sick and um, was, was only sick for a period of six days and then died so I suppose in a way it talks to the digitised grief that so many people felt during the pandemic and it was something that I, I did experience myself. So throughout the pandemic, um, I was very aware of the pain and the surreality of that grief. This poem begins with an epigraph, which refers to a 1901 experiment in Massachusetts by a doctor called Dr. Duncan MacDougall. And he was obsessed that the human soul had weight and was measurable. So he carried out experiments and he concluded that the weight of the human soul uh, could be calibrated at 21 grams, which, according to my kitchen scales, is about seven sugar cubes. When your mother phones to tell you that your father has died 10,000 miles away, visiting your emigrant brother in a different hemisphere, in a different season, do you wonder if your father's soul 
will be forever left in summer? Do you grapple with the journey home of the body of a man you have known since you were a body in your mother's body? Does the news melt into you and cool to the image of his remains in a Tasmanian blackwood coffin, in the body of a crate, in the body of a plane? Or do you place your telephone receiver back on its cradle, take your car keys, drive the winter miles to your father's field, where you know his horses will run to the rattle like dice of seven sugar cubes? When in June his alliums surprise you from the soil, it's as if the spheres are suspended from above. He stashed them away that busy October day when you forgot to ask where he was planting. Now the triumphant globes link this earth to heaven. I'm just going to finish off with two shortish poems. The penultimate one here called Ruminant is the end of that grief sequence um, of which Seven Sugar Cubes belongs in the manuscript for my first collection. And it speaks to the five stages of grief. What happens to a heart after death? It pounds around the rib cage, at last leaps through the sternum into the menacing wood, grows a coat of fur thickening around the neck, becomes crepuscular, cannot bear to be seen. Crewmans beneath its beautiful eyes secrete waxy tears, its four-chambered stomach barely taking in sustenance. From spring on, its antlers grow an inch each day, velvety at first as they emerge, but hardening to woody bone for the anger of the autumn rush. At times, the stag tips back his majestic crown. A Christ with hands nailed up, he bellows to the heavens, then sheds his antlers and begins again and again. And <clears throat> finally, growing up in County Waterford, it's kind, of, it's kind of strange because since the Greenway has come, we've become synonymous with cycling. But always throughout my childhood, you know, Sean Kelly was the sort of local hero in the county. So cycling has been in us. And when I was thinking about today's reading, I thought perhaps this poem called Stabilizers might be fitting to close the reading with. And it was a poem written for my cousin Jenny as a birthday present. But it recalls my memory of being taught uh, how to cycle by my father as a little girl. Stabilizers. You cycled a bike when you were five, a blue bike with metal stabilizers, black handlebar grips, and a white padded saddle. You cycled a bike outside each evening to wait for your father, a bike on which you'd sit and ask your father how people were able to cycle bikes without stabilizers, a bike from which your father won twilight removed the right stabiliser and told you to lean left. A bike from which your father the next evening removed the second stabiliser. He placed his right hand on the back of the saddle, his left on the handlebar grip. With his face against yours, you cycled with your back straight, your eyes fixed ahead. A bike from which your father carefully removed his hands and clapped them together. So thank you.